Hi everyone, my name is Patty Poss. I'm so glad to see you all here. Thanks so much for coming. We're really excited about today. This is the history of school segregation in Montgomery County and its Rosenwald schools and with a special presentation about the school building from, Ken, from Karen Jackson Height. Thank you um, to Municipal Cable, who's here recording the event so that we can share this with more people who couldn't be here today. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the table where you came in if you want to get the video link sent to you. Um, uh, if you're on the KHS emails and the RJC emails, you're gonna get them, but if you wanna make sure you get that link, um, we'll email it out to you. I need to say a special thanks to our sponsors for this event, which is the Kensington Historical Society, who has been a part of our Kensington community since 1977. We bring you the concert series on Saturdays, the train show, several other events, and have an archives. There are Kensington Historical Society membership forms uh, on that back table. If you would um, like to become a member or would like to support our work, uh, and Kate DeWitt is here, who is our vice president of our board back there. Thanks, Kate. And then also the Kensington Racial Justice Committee. It's a great team today, bringing both groups together. They, we strive to understand how past inequities shaped Kensington, support actions to dismantle systematic racism, celebrate our diversity, and build a more engaged and inclusive community. And we also have information about how to join that work up on the table, and there's a lot of members here today. Um, the Kensington Racial Justice Committee started in the fall of 2020, and a small group of us started looking at the history in our area, and we very quickly learned about the Ken Gar community, and we're really interested in it, and then learned about this building, and we had an incredible afternoon with Karen Jackson Knight sharing with us some incredible stories about this community. Um, so I'm anxious to hear from her too. Um, Ralph Bugas is here. He's a Montgomery County native, a Winston Churchill grad, and uh, which we'll forgive you for since we're Walter Johnson, but <laughs> he's an avid history buff and has taught a lifelong learning institutes associated with Johns Hopkins and American University and Montgomery College. He's an author of a book about Rockville's history you might want to check out. Uh, through Montgomery history, he speaks frequently to groups and you can see a lot of um, events that he has done on the Montgomery history website. If you haven't heard of Montgomery History, it's a terrific organization. It's the county's historical society. They have great information on their site. And then, of course, we're going to hear from Karen Jackson Knight, who grew up in the Kengar community, and she has a long list of accomplishments of serving this community of all ages, young people. Uh, now she's working with older adults. She's been an activist following in her father's footsteps, and she is the daughter of the namesake of this building, the Leonard D. Jackson Community Center. So we're really excited to hear the information she has to share about this. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I give this talk to school groups and I always like to sort of set the stage um, in talking about the history of school segregation in our county. Um, as I outline the history, I'll just reflect on its legacy, um, which, which Patty also talked about, but also the extent to which uh, educational disparities that I'll detail translated into reduced opportunities later in life. And of course, education is so important for, for individuals getting ahead. And uh, just in terms of the long lasting effects of that that we are still dealing with today. Now today, Montgomery County is quite progressive, but it's important to remember that uh, Historically, Montgomery County was, uh, was part of um, a southern state, Maryland south of the uh, Mason-Dixon line, of course, sanctioned slavery, that is allowed slavery, and then after the Civil War, segregated its schools. And uh, in our history, um, not only in the county, but in the state, uh, Discrimination, inequities uh, took various forms. I've just uh, pictorially represented some here. Uh, but it's probably school segregation that um, is perhaps the most egregious because it was absolutely embedded in law. I showed you, I showed you one um, sit-in at a restaurant in Rockville. Uh, there were not uh, laws here um, segregating uh, restaurants. It was largely 
um, what the owner decided. That's why you had protests at the Bethesda Theater, for example. You had protests at Glen Echo, which I also showed. But school segregation was absolutely embedded in law and lasted for almost a century, as I said, after the Civil War when African-American communities formed all over our county, um, all the way up until 1961, so about a century of history that we're talking about here. Now, a major milestone in the story, of course, is the uh, landmark Supreme Court ruling in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, which declared unconstitutional uh, segregated schools um, largely throughout the South, uh, but it was, of course, met with massive resistance. That was won by the legendary civil rights attorney, Thurgood Marshall, uh, later the first African-American Supreme Court justice, but a, uh, a much younger Thurgood Marshall, uh, here he is in 1937, was here in Montgomery County. He was leaning right against the front steps of the old gray courthouse in Rockville with, um, with two colleagues, um, including Charles Hamilton Houston, very uh, important also in the civil rights movement, Charles Hamilton Houston there on the uh, far left. Uh, he was here to argue a case about unequal public school uh, salaries, the unequal salaries paid to white teachers in the white schools and black teachers in the black schools. Um, at the time, um, well, I'll get, into the, I'll get into that case a little later on. But uh, so significant, this local case, that one legal scholar says that as a result of, uh, of this case here, you could argue that the long road to Brown versus Board of Education, that seminal Supreme Court landmark, started right here in Montgomery County with this case. So a lot of history here, I have I've, I've attempted to boil it down into sort of a three-act play um, to help guide you through. Um, so first, right after the Civil War, as I said, African, -American, uh, African Americans uh, banded together into uh, communities all around the county. And in terms of schools, um, started establishing schools in those communities uh, before the county began um, extending public education to the uh, children in those communities, the children of, by and large, the uh, newly emancipated. So the communities took it on themselves to, uh, to uh, provide that important uh, uh, step. Then came public schools. This is when the county then uh, um, provided uh, the, the schooling. Uh, but uh, as I've said, in separate schools, uh, a completely separate system well into the 20th century. And then the final act of this, uh, beginning with Thurgood Marshall's early legal challenge here in Montgomery County and following the Brown decision, uh, the what I call the slow demise of um, school segregation, uh, the county desegregating its schools over the next uh, half decade from when the Supreme Court ruled in 1954 and then the uh, schools here in our county were uh, declared desegregated uh, by 1961. So our story really starts in Sandy Spring in the far, far eastern part of our county, uh, primarily a, a, a community of Quakers who um, by and large emancipated their enslaved beginning in the late 1700s. So Sandy Spring had a, a significant um, pre-Civil War free African-American community, one of, one of the earliest in the state. Uh, well, that is the Friends Community Meeting House representing the Quakers. And then in terms of the free African-American community, this church, um, an earlier version of this church had the first school for African Americans. That was uh, by 1864. 1864, a crucial year also, because a new state constitution uh, abolished slavery in our state, actually making Maryland the first Southern state to do so. And there's a lot of history involved in that, mostly because so many Southern sympathizers from our county were away uh, in the South fighting the Civil War. 
In any event, uh, that uh, constitution also established the county by county public school system that we have today, uh, but really only for white children. There was no, um, no thought given to educating the children of the newly emancipated, emancipated by that same constitution. Uh, it really was not until eight years later that that came about. From 1864, the new constitution, until finally in 1872, a state law, which as you see, uh, required um, uh, schools, separate schools, and right down to separate budgets. In other words, uh, tax dollars from the white county residents went to the white schools, and tax dollars from the black county residents went to fund the black schools. And so, uh, so uh, of course, never enough money for the black schools. Now, in the interim between 1864 and 1872, and this is Act I that I talked about, uh, the black communities on their own opened schools. These were community schools uh, for their children, but not yet officially public schools, that is, run by the county. Um, often in churches, because churches were often the first institution that the black communities would, uh, would build. And they were assisted by two organizations in particular. First, philanthropic groups, so one of which you see here, Baltimore Association for the Moral and Educational Improvement of the Colored People, using the language of the time. Um, uh, this organization uh, worked throughout Maryland, but uh, it, essentially what you're seeing is a contract with the uh, black communities. The organization would provide a teacher as long as the communities could provide some kind of space for a school to be held, and so usually, usually a church. Also assisting was the Freedmen's Bureau. The, there's the uh, full title of the organization. I'm sure you've heard about this federal agency. It was created after the Civil War to, uh, to um, operate throughout the South to help the newly emancipated um, move into a whole new way of life. And significantly, as you can see here, there was an office right here in Montgomery County. Um, most of us probably think of the Freedmen's Freedman, the Bureau as working in the former Confederacy. But in fact, as I said, Maryland a, southern, a, a, a slave state, and so um, it did also operate here. And um, it worked uh, to uh, help set up some of these community schools. In some cases, it provided building materials. Um, in other cases, it received petitions from the black communities. This is one from the uh, African-American community in Rockville. You see, uh, uh, it, it was signed by uh, 20 men in Rockville uh, to uh, uh, extend their pledge to support a school. Now, it's interesting to note that of those 20 signatories, uh, 15 had to sign their names with an X because they themselves had been uh, uh, deprived of education. And even um, rather touchingly, uh, one who could sign his name, you see that he had some some difficulty, still, still learning himself. And as a result of this petition, within months, a school opened in the basement of this historic African-American church in Rockville, in, in the heart of the city. Uh, and then um, just a year later, I know it's impossible to read this, but an African-American woman in Rockville, Mary Bashirs, um, sold to the community for one dollar, a half acre of land, for the purpose of erect, uh, ex erecting or allowing to be erected a schoolhouse for the use, uh, benefit, and education of the colored people of Montgomery County forever. So again, a testament to the uh, importance that the, the community placed on schooling for their children. Uh, the uh, Freedmen's Bureau wasted no time in providing building materials for this school. Um, and the, by the next year, you see uh, August 1869, this is again another report from the Freedmen's Bureau for Montgomery County, among other counties in the state of Maryland. There you see 
the two uh, already existing schools, Sandy Spring and Rockville, eight others uh, formed with the assistance of uh, the Freedmen Bu Freedmen's Bureau, but really the uh, communities themselves, the Freedmen's Bureau by and large for these eight others um, arranged for getting a teacher, usually from uh, the Baltimore Association or another philanthropic organization. And again, not yet uh, county run public schools because you see run either by school trustees, that's the community or uh, churches. I'll mention just this last one. It's, it's labeled here Damascus. It was uh, this church where the school uh, was held, the church building doubling as a school. Today, it's the uh, Pleasant Grove Community Church, a little west of Damascus. And that is the original building there, the original chapel that held a school. And so quite significantly, this uh, is the only building remaining in Montgomery County that was associated with the Freedmen's Bureau. All right, let's jump ahead now to 1872. This is what I call Act Two, with finally the state law requiring schools, that the county uh, open schools for uh, African-American children. And this is where Kengar uh, eventually enters the picture. Uh, now, even though it was said to be the duty of the county to establish at least one school in, a, in an election district, that's how the county was divided at the time, there were five election districts then, one school would hardly have been enough. Um, but uh, what the county started doing was incorporating some of these community schools into the county system. So this is the first one that was incorporated. This is the, uh, uh, or was a one room uh, community school built by the community in Norbeck, Mount Pleasant, and uh, the, uh, sold to the county and thus became a county school. And then the uh, county was then providing a teacher, not the uh, philanthropic organizations as had been up until then. Uh, the county gradually incorporated other schools or, or in other ways uh, they came about. In this community, um, a little uh, northwest of Sandy Spring, um, the Mount Zion community, um, as soon as that 1872 law was passed, they went to the school board and asked for funding to build a school. And, and yes, the community still built the school, but it's that building still standing today um, used by the church there. So again, you see the church school connection. Used, no longer school, obviously, used by the church. But this is the earliest surviving black public school in, in our county. Now, it's interesting to note that when this school closed in 1939, the county discovered that it never, remember, this was a county building. Um, they had funded it. The county discovered that they ne actually never had a deed to the property. Uh, the community was so anxious for a school that they had just informally donated the land. Again, testament to the importance of education. Um, this community, I, I hope that you've, you've driven by it. Um, uh, this spot, again, a little different. In this community, um, the uh, Quince Orchard community, um, the African Americans built a school first, even before a church. You see both buildings there today but they built a school building first, and then probably the church met in the school building, of course. Um, and then it was also incorporated into the county system, just like uh, I've been talking about. But later that original school building burned down and burned under suspicious circumstances. Um, there was uh, hostility to African-American schools, and this was, this was the early 1900s, still lingering hostility. Um, and so, uh, rather than build a new building, the county in this case moved a, uh, a former white school that was considered um, uh, not up to par, uh, moved it from fairly nearby to have it replace the burned down school. And it's that portion, it's the um, rightmost portion of the building that does stand there today. The window configuration has changed. And uh, oh, let me back up here a minute because um, if you've driven by here recently, this, this is um, uh, an older photograph because uh, both of these buildings are undergoing some renovation, restoration, I should, should say, so that they're still to be used um, to uh, tell the story of this African-American community. So the front steeple there, which was leaning and leaning, has now been 
taken off and will, I understand, be, uh, be restored. Um, it's, it's on Route 28 west of Rockville, just a little beyond uh, the very large police headquarters these days. Now, another African-American community was Martinsburg. This is west of Poolsville. Um, not really an active community today, but three important buildings still stand there, as you see. The church, um, the school, and a third building in the back that I'll mention in just a moment. Now, in this case, um, the community started a school in the church, very similar to what I've been talking about, and uh, it, uh, the school met even as a public school in the church until the county finally built that separate building, a one-room school, um, uh, just under two decades later. So this, even as public schools, still meeting in the churches. Now, that third building in the back is very important. It's a benevolent society building. In many commu African-American communities, there were these organizations where um, people would essentially pay dues and the money would be pooled together to uh, uh, provide a burial for community members or uh, uh, support for orphans. Um, and uh, so things like insurance or just a general community meeting place uh, which things that were services that were not otherwise available in a very rigidly segregated society. This, this spot is called the Warren Historic Site today for the Warren Church. That church is no longer active, but the site is being maintained by dedicated volunteers. Very important because these three institutions were, were so important in African American communities. And it's believed this is the only site in the state of Maryland and perhaps beyond where all three of these buildings still stand. And the, the uh, Benevolent Society building was recently uh, painstakingly restored um, after nearly falling down because it's so important that uh, these uh, buildings, uh, these institutions uh, be remembered. It took quite a while for uh, other uh, black communities to get a school building. This is Poolsville itself, uh, Martinsburg a little west of Poolsville. Uh, in this spot, um, the uh, community first met as a, a school in this building, another benevolent society building, no longer still standing, a two-story building like the other. Um, and uh, then it became a county school, again incorporated into the county system, uh, 1880, but still meeting in this community building all the way up until 1927, until an actual school building was built for the uh, community, uh, the uh, scattered communities around Poolsville, scattered African American communities. Now, 1927 is where um, I want to introduce Kengar into the picture because uh, the building we're in was built in 1927, actually the portion in the back there where you came in. And, uh, uh, and then an addition was built, and we're in the addition here. You see uh, as we step down into this portion here. So a two-room school um, first uh, coming about in 1927. Now the history of the, of the Kengar School goes back a little further, but it is the building um, that we're in today. You can see it's the same basic structure, but um, uh, definitely renovated. Um, the, a school started in this community in 1904. So um, well after the Civil War, the, as, you, as you probably came in, you saw Kengar established 1892. Um, the church right next door, um, started early 1900s, and then the pastor of that church started holding school in the church. It became a, uh, a county school, so the county then providing a teacher. Beginning in 1912, they continued to rent the church building, still no actual building for the, for the children of this community. A building of sorts came about, again, sort of similar to uh, um, the Quince Orchard community, when the county moved a used one-room white school to this spot, and it was you, you can imagine it was probably not in good condition because it was only used for uh, nine years until they finally built the uh, first portion of the building that we're in today. Some schools never actually got an actual school building, and again, we return to that uh, site 
uh, uh, near Poolsville that is uh, associated with the Freedmen's Bureau. It later became a county school also. It was called the Purdom School. Um, but for the entire existence that this was a county school until 1939, it met in the church, never getting a school building. And, and sometimes when enrollment was, lo was low, the county would simply close this school. And the children, um, if, they were, if they continued their education, had to make it all the way to the other side of, of Damascus, to another black school there, also meeting in a church. Um, Yes, the county did build some buildings, and we have this one still today, the Boyd School. It is uh, maintained as a school museum to show what uh, early education was like, but also um, to show segregated schooling because at the uh, Boyd School, there is a sewing machine and there are tools. Um, by and large, boys trained in manual labor. I should say that, of course, academics were stressed, but also vocational skills because, again, uh, employment opportunities would be so limited in a uh, segregated so society. So sewing, the girls likely to be domestics and the boys uh, manual laborers. This school opened in 1896. That's another very important year because that's the year that the US Supreme Court enshrined into law the so-called separate but equal doctrine, which was playing out here in Montgomery County and throughout the South. Uh, but of course, nothing equal about the facilities. As, as we've seen, the African-American schools, um, by and large, overcrowded, definitely more students um, in uh, the usually one-room school Hand-me-down books, uh, I've also talked about hand-me-down school buildings, uh, inadequate supplies, uh, the teachers paid less. I uh, referred to this earlier, and that was the basis for Thurgood Marshall's uh, case. And a shorter school year, actually. Um, after the uh, children were um, needed um, by their families, as well as area farmers, uh, to help with planting and then uh, harvesting uh, spring and fall. So the uh, school year was shorter um, by law. And sometimes the uh, money ran out. As I said, uh, we have one uh, case of uh, the, the African-American schools closing as early as March 4th. That was in 1904, the money had run out. So this um, US government report of Montgomery County, um, uh, we are quite fortunate to have this. Uh, the the uh, Bureau of Education, part of the Interior Department at that time, wanted to do an educational survey of a suburban and rural county, and so happens that county was just across the line in Montgomery County. But it gives us a look at separate but equal based on some cold, hard numbers. Here is the school budget for 1911. As I said, entirely separate budgets. And so when you uh, figure in the enrollment, uh, what we uh, label the per pupil expenditure today was as actually spent on education. At that time, the county was spending five times as much on the white students as the African-American students. The disparity would have been even larger as you went uh, further south. Uh, the report also noted that the black schools were uh, uh, neglected and dilapidated, an understatement, but uh, quite interestingly, 58% of eligible black students were attending school. Now this is before compulsory education compared to 51% of eligible white students. Again, a testament to the value of education put on by the African, put on education by the African American communities. And furthermore, uh, in terms of teacher qualifications, sorry, went too fast here. Uh, teacher qualifications, remember white teachers in the white schools, black teachers in the black schools, but large, uh, roughly equally qualified um, normal schools, what teacher training schools were called at that time, um, and especially significant um, because even high school was so limited for African Americans. There was, at this time, uh, no high school for African Americans in Montgomery County, and I'll mention that a little bit coming up. 
Um, and so uh, you can see that, again, uh, value placed on education. So a, a teacher in um, the one room Rocky Ridge School, um, just a little south of Clarksburg, uh, sums, uh, sums up what all this meant in terms of education. 40 students in that one room. She says the school board doesn't send many resources our way, so the community pitches in. Uh, everyone's very supportive, and she uh, ends there saying, I always bring extra lunch to share to make sure no one goes hungry. So it's against this backdrop that uh, Rosenwald schools are so significant. And this is a Rosenwald school. Rosenwald schools came about in the early 1900s um, throughout the segregated South. They are named Rosenwald schools. They were still public schools, but named Rosenwald schools for Julius Rosenwald, who was then president of Sears Roebuck. He formed something of a partnership with Booker T. Washington, the president of then Tuskegee Institute. Uh, Booker T. Washington said, we need better school buildings for the black children in the South. Uh, Julius Rosenwald, as I said, president of Sears Roebuck, that was the catalog days of Sears Roebuck. Sears was the Amazon of its time. Julius Rosenwald was very wealthy. Ultimately, he contributed about $4 million, that's a lot of money in those days, um, to help construct public schools for African-American kids throughout the South. This map shows where they were all located, about 5,000, uh, a little more than 5,000 there because there were some auxiliary buildings sometimes built also part of these schools. Now to give you an idea of the significance of these schools, after they were all built, um, the uh, Ro Rosenwald Fund went out of business um, 1932. Um, one of every three African-American children attended a Rosenwald school in the South. Now, this, these are not private schools. They were still going to public schools. These were run by the school authorities, so still with hand-me-down books, but the facility themselves so much, uh, so much improved. They were, they were built according to designs um, put out by Tuskegee Institute, and I'll show you um, some here in Montgomery County. So Maryland, the northernmost reach of these Rosenwald schools, remember a southern state south of the Mason-Dixon line, um, at one time we had 17 Rosenwald schools here in Montgomery County, built all in the decade of the 1920s. And after they were all built, in contrast to the rest of the South, two of every three African-American children atten attended a Rosenwald school in our county. So Ken Gar is one of five surviving Rosenwald schools, the building that we're sitting in today, a sacred space. Uh, the the uh, best surviving school, is, uh, Rosenwald school, is the Smithville School. This is on um, Randolph Road, a little east of New Hampshire Avenue. It's right at a bend in the road, and if you're headed east, you probably don't even see it because you're watching out for that bend in the road. It was restored by members of Phi Alpha, uh, Phi Alpha, thank you, thank you, Alpha Phi Alpha, um, the oldest African American fraternity in, in the country, many of whose members had attended this school. Um, it is not, as they say, an authentic restoration. There you see the typical large windows of the uh, Rosenwald schools according to the Tuskegee plan, but um, wonderful that it has been saved and is uh, sometimes open to the public. And um, recently when it was open, um, I happened to be there when this woman came in and she was absolutely delighted to see her picture as a little girl because she had attended this school. So again, this is not ancient history by any means. A sign out front uh, describes why it's so important to remember this history. That which was designed to separate us will unite us. Uh, let me mention a couple of non-surviving Rosenwald schools. This was the uh, uh, Rockville Elementary School for uh, uh, black children. Came along in 1921. It was the first Rosenwald school in our county. Um, uh, two stories, as you see. 
and then later in 1927 built uh, next to it, so you can see the original building there in the background, was the first high school for African American students in the county, 1927, the same year that uh, this, this building, the first uh, uh, half of this building was built. And by that time, um, of course, uh, high school had already started for the white students. Not too far away in Rockville was uh, the uh, first Montgomery County High School, as it was called, uh, evolved into Richard Montgomery High School. Um, so you see that it was, uh, again, several decades later. And by the time the African American school opened, um, some high school classes had been uh, provided for the white children beginning 1892. So either uh, 25 to some 35 years later, finally high schooling for African American children. And by the time it was built, there were 10 high schools for the white children all around the county. This was the only high school for African American children. And it was later replaced by other um, buildings in Rockville. But at any one time, there was only one high school for African American children in our entire county until desegregation. And uh, the same year that uh, this high school opened, the first iteration of Bethesda Chevy Chase High School opened. So you can see there, large brick building versus a uh, wood frame building. Picture is worth a thousand words. Um, the, the black high school originally was seven, grade seven and eight, uh, didn't go to 11th grade until 1930 and then uh, full 12th grade until 1942. The white high schools did include the full uh, 12 years by this time. And transportation was not initially provided. Remember, you know, only high school, so if you lived in Sandy Spring or a far-flung part of the county, transportation was a problem. So again, the African-American community banded together, pooled resources, and uh, bought a second-hand bus that you see there, and it was driven by the uh, young man sitting on the hood, a student at the school, would drive it morning and afternoon. Uh, later high school was Lincoln High School. This still stands in Lincoln Park in, uh, in uh, Rockville. Um, yes, finally a brick high school, but really this was a um, wooden building that was moved to Rockville from Tacoma Park, and then a brick facade put up around it to match the then same year, uh, the larger Bethesda Chevy Chase High School that uh, that's the original building of it. Still stands on East West Highway up here. So um, this school um, overcrowded again, even though it was the only one. Over and transportation a problem. Overcrowded right away. A, a wooden addition was built out back by the industrial arts class, and then later uh, Quonset huts were added for uh, the gym and uh, I think the cafeteria. Um, after, uh, obviously, there were no Quonset huts at the uh, white high schools. So again, keep the disparities in mind. Finally, a modern high school, generally on par in terms of physical facility for the African-American students. Uh, Carver High School, it's used by the uh, school system today as the administrative offices. And... Uh, Alums remember this school affectionately. This, uh, uh, the uh, facilities were just such a vast improvement than, than what had been provided until that time. At the same time Carver was built, there were finally modern elementary schools also built for the African American children. Four around the county, uh, they were called consolidated elementary schools so that the small one and two room schools were were closed and um, uh, students bus to these larger schools. And significantly, finally, um, you see one here. This is the Sandy Springs School. Um, the building has been quite remodeled to be a uh, senior center today, but others are still standing around the county. And significantly, um, this was the first time each grade had its own classroom in the African-American schools. Remember, with a, with a one-room elementary school, you had grades one through six or one through seven, all in that one room with one teacher. First time for kindergarten, too. Um, Nina Clark, a, a, a 
a teacher in the African-American schools, later one of the first um, um, black uh, administrators in the uh, desegregated system, passed away recently at age 104, I think. Have that right? 103, gave her an extra year. Uh, Nina Clark says, it's like Montgomery County finally got a conscience, but also you can look at it in another way because of course the Brown decision was working its way through the courts and the handwriting was on the wall. So sometimes these, school, these schools are called equalization schools and especially in other Southern states, they finally pumped a lot of money into uh, schools that they could claim were in fact equal. Oh, I'm still clicking here, go ahead. Uh, so as I said, an attempt to uh, show uh, they could be equal. There was supposed to be a fifth modern elementary school built here down county, but then indeed the, Brown de uh, the uh, planning for it got hung up a little bit and uh, the Brown decision was handed down, so it was never built. And so four schools down county here, including this one, um, that were still being used for the black children in 1955, were the first to uh, be closed and the students um, sent to uh, white schools nearest where they lived. But again, this really put the onus on the, on the black students because they were, um, they were the newcomers into established white schools and generally uh, you know, far fewer in number. So just you know, think about that and put yourself in their shoes. 1955, as I said. Um, schools, uh, Montgomery County desegregation is a uh, big um, topic. I'll just try to summarize it by the initial proposal was to desegregate one grade per year. You can uh, count how long that would have taken. Uh, resistance, scattered resistance um, only in Poolsville and Chevy Chase Elementary School. But the superintendent at the time was firm that the schools are going to be desegregated. Um, but he didn't last. He then resigned also. Uh, got a lot of pushback. Uh, former supervisor of black education, there you see Margaret Jones. Uh, she became the first principal of a former white school. That was Bannockburn. But in a way, that was something of a demotion because she had been serving as supervisor of black education. And that was a, an administrative, uh, a much higher level um, administrative position. Desegregation accomplished by the 1960-61 school year. That's when the county said that the all the black schools had been closed, but there were still some all white schools in the county because of uh, residential patterns. And that's largely still what we are living with today. Uh, Montgomery County was the first in Maryland to uh, desegregate its schools. But as I said, some were still um, all white. So let me end with Thurgood Marshall's case. This is 1937 and uh, involving the uh, unequal salaries. Uh, Mr. William B. Gibbs, Jr., a teacher at the Rockville Elementary School that I showed, uh, was the plaintiff in this case. He uh, wrote to a young Thurgood Marshall who had just moved to New York, a Baltimore native, um, and uh, he, uh, want, uh, Mr. Gibbs said that he wanted to uh, begin a lawsuit against the county over the unequal salaries. He was paid $612 per year versus almost double what a white teacher with the same number of years of experience and the same um, uh, uh, degree uh, was paid. And so the case was um, uh, heard in Rockville. As you can see, this was big news in the African-American community. This is the Afro-American newspaper out of Baltimore. But by and large, when, as we would say today, went under the radar screen of what uh, the mainstream media, as we would say today. Uh, to boil it all down, um, the school board sought an immediate dismissal of this case. They said that separate but equal was the law of the land and that there were valid reasons for paying the black teachers less. But a um, three-judge panel, which was quite unusual, um, the one judge assigned to the case asked for two others to join him on the case, recognizing that it was indeed significant. Uh, the three-judge panel unanimously ruled that there should be a full trial. In other words, they they uh, turned down the school board's motion for a dismissal. And that's actually as far as the case got because the school board in the face of that uh, uh, agreed to settle out of court. They said that they would pay 
Um, they would equalize the salaries. They said they didn't have enough money to do it immediately. This case uh, was heard June um, 1937. So they said when the school year began in, in September, they would pay the black teachers half of the differential and then the following September would pay the full amount. So this was a huge victory um, at, to equalize the salaries. Uh, again, you see a banner headline in the Afro-American newspaper. The uh, earlier um, uh, preliminary decision, uh, not quite as much uh, uh, coverage, you could say, but it's this earlier decision that Professor Larry Gibson at the University of Maryland Law School which incidentally Thurgood Marshall wanted to attend but couldn't because it was segregated. Uh, Larry Gibson says that because of this early ruling, it amounts to a land, the ruling right here in Montgomery County to allow the case to go forward. He says it itself is a landmark ruling, marking the first time that any court in the nation found that black professionals with the same experience and credentials as white professionals had the right to equal pay. And uh, he further notes that it was also the first legal victory in the nation against K through 12 public schooling, which is what Brown was all about. You've probably heard of other cases, forerunner to Brown, which involved law schools, um, but this involved the K through 12 public school system right here in Montgomery County. As a result, he says, it all started in Rockville. I love that quote. Mr. Gibbs, unfortunately, was fired a year later. The school board said it was not in retaliation. He had been serving as acting principal of that school. Um, remember, the high school was built next to it. The high school had by that time moved to uh, Lincoln High School, so that elementary school became four uh, rooms. One of the teachers had to be, uh, was designated to be principal. He, he had been designated, hadn't been a problem before the lawsuit, but after the lawsuit, the school board said, well, lo and behold, you don't really have the credentials to be principal. Uh, that, that, would, that was about 1939, about a year later. We do have a school named for Mr. Gibbs. We are a different county today. Um, and uh, He uh, finished out his career in New Jersey. Uh, it is in uh, Germantown, just a little ways off uh, I-270, I think off on the Ridge Road. And in Rockville itself, um, there is this work of art. It is dedicated to Mr. Gibbs, uh, educator, leader, advocate. Please take a look at it the next time you're there in Town Square. It is right on Gibbs Street, which almost runs from, uh, buildings in between, almost runs from the Great Courthouse to where Mr. Gibbs' school stood. There's also a uh, bench there with a, um, a fictionalized newspaper, I'll say, because it didn't, as I said, it didn't get um, large coverage like this, but with a headline, I don't want to, certainly don't want to say fake news, um, with a large headline, Gibbs' suit wins racial equity in teacher pay. So that's the uh, three-act play, um, uh, really boiling down a long story of school uh, segregation and desegre. Oh, Th I'm all done. <laughs> this, this is extra stuff for a different presentation. Uh, so um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Jackson Knight. I'm a former resident of the Kengar Community Center, former president of the Kengar Civic Association, and uh, my father, my family has taken care of the community for about 50 or 60 years. <laughs> and I'm still trying to, a little bit at a time. Okay, well, as you can see, this was one of the Rosenwald schools. The history behind our Rosenwald school is that in the 1970s, well, in the 1950s, right after integration of the public schools, this building right here, if you can imagine it, became a two family apartment. Down here where we are right now, there was a family that lived down here. There were three bedrooms. Can you imagine three tiny little bedrooms down here and a little tiny living room in this little room? Can you imagine? Upstairs, if you get a chance to go upstairs and around the corner was the other family living area. They had three little tiny bedrooms, 
a small living room, and a small kitchen. And what I found out from other people here, uh, relatives and all that went to this school here, right in the middle was the cafeteria here in Kengar. And the food, the lunches were provided by the ladies of Kensington. The, Ken the Kensington Women's Board helped provide lunches for the kids here at Kengar at one time or another. Um, so can you imagine, even up there at the top, a three-bedroom apartment? Probably, oh well, the rooms were probably no bigger than the kitchen area, if I remember how big they were. So if you want to look back into the kitchen, can you imagine what kind of bed you could put in there? And by, back then, they didn't think about bunk beds. <laughs> you know, that didn't work. So it became a two-family apartment up until the 1970s when Kengard was one of Montgomery County's first urban renewal program in the county. And that was where they came and remodeled the whole community. We had dirt roads, we didn't have street lights, uh, insufficient bathrooms, whatever you want to say. That's when they decided to put in the urban renewal. Uh, this building at about 19, 1979 became the community center for Kengar. Before we didn't have a community center, but during those times we had things like um, home study, which was a program that was instituted here in Kengar where we went to people's homes by grades and we had people from the outside volunteer to help us with our homework. It was hard for a lot of us because we had just, a lot of our parents couldn't help us because they didn't know how, and so we got a lot of outside help, okay? Uh, in the 1980s, the Recreation Department came here after the urban renewal. It was run, it was an after-school program put on by the Recreation Department and a community member. The community member was Dolores Keith, hence the uh, elevator in the back. We had the only community center back then that had an elevator. And it was an elevator that was never used. Miss Keith was handicapped, so when she came into the building, she would get the boys to wheel her around the corner, lift her wheelchair up into the building. In later years, we used it as a moving vehicle. We would put tables and chairs inside and move them from one floor to the other because the chairs and tables were very heavy. And I think they still do it when people borrow the center. Um, anyway, they had an after-school program in the 19, 1980s. We had a summer program for the children, and the children got free lunches in the summer program provided by the county. Uh, the community used the building for parties, birthday parties, uh, family parties, Halloween parties. We just party. That's all I can say. We party. That's what the community center's for, right? You party. Okay. Um, we also had a sneakers program for the children, for the young girls, put on by Crittenden House. Most of you might know that Crittenden House was the home in D.C. for unwed mothers. And the sneakers program was an offshot of their Pearl program. The mothers, the unwed mothers at Crittenden House were called Pearls, and the younger people were called sneakers program, sneakers. You know, the young tennis shoes worked. Um, in the 1980s, Mobile Med, who we had at First Baptist Church in the basement, which was a free medical program for the people in Kengar and eventually all of the county, whoever wanted to come, used this building also for psychiatric evaluations. Dr. Monroe Myersberg would meet anybody who needed a psychiatrist. He would meet over here in this building. It was away from everything and uh, you know, you could kind of keep your personal business to yourself because a lot of people didn't want people to know that they were going to see a shrink. You know, that's how that was. Um, in the mid-1980s, after home study had closed, we had Saturday school for the kids. The kids came here on Saturdays and they had volunteer tutors from all around the area that came and helped them with their homework. Most of the kids, I know my son hated to get up on Saturdays. He always had a reason why he wasn't coming over here for Saturday school, but he needed it. Um, 
Then in the 1990s, the Coalition of Black Police Officers of Montgomery County, they started to meet here. And in later years, they brought things to us like street jams with WPGC. So we had street jams that started here on the parking lot and we blocked off all of Plyers Mill Road. WPGC brought in different local bands. And again, we're part of the community, so we party. We barbecued out here on the parking lot, but we partied up and down the streets. And, and the Black Coalition of Police Officers actually provided the uh, protection that we needed. And we were really lucky because they advertised that on the, t on the radio for a whole week. So can you imagine this little strip with people from all over Montgomery County, PG, and DC out here? It was crowded, but we partied. Um, the churches also uses, they used and still do use the center for um, vacation Bible school. They also, this church right here next door, which is a historical church in Montgomery County, Lee's AME Memorial Church, uses it for repasses because most of the families are very big and the church's facilities are not that big to uh, accommodate the families. Okay. Um, in 1991, we used this building for the SHARE program. This was a food program put on by Catholic Charities. We were asked by the Montgomery County, um, was one of the Montgomery County groups to put it on. They only had three places in Montgomery County that did it. There was St. Camillo's in Silver Spring, St. Martin's in Gaithersburg, and Kimgar. We did SHARE, uh, and that was providing food to people for $13 a package. That way they got uh, vegetables, they got meat, they got uh, fruit, all for $13 and all they had to do in addition was to provide two hours of community service for each $13 package. Um, Ken Gar was has been the first in a lot of things. We had people come from Iowa visiting family members, people coming from Danville, Virginia visiting family members at the time we were having the SHARE program and they liked it so much, they branched out SHARE for Catholic Charities into the communities where they lived at. So we were first in a lot and we were also picked as one of the most successful SHARE programs. As an offshot of ours, SHARE appeared in different places in the community, but community in Montgomery County, but what, what always amazed me was that they never appeared in the Catholic churches. Catholic programs, but never in the Catholic churches. It was really odd, but it fed a lot of people. But along the way, in, uh, we also had the Manor Food Program. Anybody remember Manor Food? Yeah. The food program? It's not what it is now. It started out where they went to the communities, mainly the low income communities, and they provided government cheese and butter to anybody who wanted to come and get the government cheese and butter. That's how small Manor was when it first started. And now it's huge, right? Okay. Um, in 1992, we had a drug and alcohol program for the youth of Kengar. It was put on by the Junior League of Washington. We received a $10,000 grant to run an after-school program here. So it, it helped provide uh, a safe haven for the kids, a place for them to come and do their homework. Uh, they went on trips. They did a lot of things through this program. This program was brought to Kengar by the Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County, the uh, Wheaton Government Center, which is now called, I think, the Mid Government Center now in Wheaton, and the Wheaton Neighborhood Network Fighting Drugs and Alcohol. They applied for a grant for Kengar. That was an honor to be picked for that. Uh, so there again, the kids, we party. But through this program, through this program, the children got to do a lot of things. They went down to the cable TV station at one time or another, down in the town of Kensington, to learn about cable TV. Also, they learned how to do it through the SPARK program, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, it, we did it in conjunction with the Bethesda YMCA. And through that, 
They, the children got to do a lot of things they normally wouldn't do. Black kids didn't do spadonky. They didn't know what it was to go into a cave with the lights on. You know, we went to Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and there was a cave over there, and the kids went in, and of course, like children, when you cut the lights out, you know what they're doing. They're touching this one. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. Don't touch me. Fun times. They also went whitewater rafting down the Potomac. They, uh, and also down over in uh, the Potomac with, oh, they did rock climbing. These were things that African American children did not do, especially when they went whitewater rafting. I remember the day that there was a crowd down by the Potomac, and I heard a lady say, Oh, I'm not leaving yet. I want to see these black kids. They're going whitewater rafting. We didn't pay any attention. It was a hot day, I and mean, we were going swimming afterwards, so it didn't matter, you know. Um, and that's, that was a drug and alcohol program. They also did things like going up on Goody Drive to the drug addiction place to see what it was about, hopefully, that none of them would ever have to go, you know. Um, and then, like in, uh, excuse me, 1992, September 1992, Ken Gar became 100 years old. We partied again. <laughs> we partied right out here. Uh, we had all the groups that had had some input into something in Ken Gar. We had the police department, the 4D police department. No, 2D, 2D. I'm in 4D now. Uh, the 2D and Bethesda Police Department, the K-9 Division came. Uh, we had Mobile Med. We had uh, oh, so many groups of people that had actually done something in Kingar. And I remember at that time I asked a lot of kids, including mine, did they ever remember that Santa Claus came to this community center right out there in a helicopter one year? Santa Claus came in a helicopter and gave out gifts. My kids don't remember. But I did show my daughter the papers that said that they came in the helicopter, you know. Um, so in 1996 and 1998, we did the street jams. Party, party, party. Um, and each year, we had a community cookout, which we did for the community, sponsored by the Civic Association, right here on the lot. And we had our own DJs, you know, and uh, everybody in the community. They may not have helped to set it up, but when it was time to take it down, it was a lot of help. Always a lot of help because there was a lot of food left over, <laughs> you know, to see who was going to get what food, okay? From 1995 to 2008, the award-winning program, tutoring program called SPARK came out of this community. It was, SPARK stood for Students Practicing and Respecting Knowledge. Uh, we had the name SPARK before we had the uh, wording. Do what you got to do. One day, a young tutor was sitting down just doodling, and he came up with the reasons why we came. We named it Spark, which we've had ever since. Um, Spark was a tutoring program for Kensington Parkwood Elementary School, North Bethesda, and Walter Johnson High School. It was open to any child who wanted extra help with their homework. We started out with Spark in this building two nights a week on. Tuesdays and Thursdays, because those were the main days that the kids seemed to need help with their homework. All the volunteers mainly came from the town of Kensington. Randy. Uh, huh? Randy Lesko. Yeah, oh, I forgot about my sister. I forgot about my sister. Wendy, Wendy Lesko and I were co-founders. We were co-founders of Spark. Wendy lived over on Prospect Street, and I lived in Kengar. And we got together by a freaky thing, but we both wanted to improved the grades at Kensington Park Elementary School, and that's how we got sparked together. Uh, neither one of us were educators. We just jumped into it one night, and we got all the help that we needed, and it just prospered for about 13 years. We went out of business in 2013 because the kids stopped coming. But during that time, we had no teenage pregnancy. We took the kids on trips, places they'd never been. One time we went to the Amistad, anybody remember the Amistad ship that came to visit DC? We went to visit the Amistad. Um, they advertised that the kids could come and visit the ship, but they never said that it was only for DC children. I didn't find that out until I tried to book it, 
And the lady said, well, you can't come. You're not from D.C. So I said, oh. I said, okay. She said, you can't come. So I just did, mm. I said, watch me. <laughs> I had a friend who was providing the oil for the Amistad. So I called him and I said, I want to take my kids to visit the Amistad ship. And he said, okay, I'm doing the oil for them. I'll give you a call back and tell you when you can come and whatever. We went down to visit the Amistad ship. The kids enjoyed it. But of course, they enjoyed the pizza even better afterwards. <laughs> but the Amistad ship was a place where we went. We went to all kinds of places. We tried to take them out of the norm of the community to see that there were other things possible in this world other than this little community. Consequently, in 2000, uh, many of you, if you watch Fox 5, know Holly Morris. She came here to do a program. We don't even know how she found out about Kengar. She came to do a program about Kengar, and she named us as the community that nobody knew anything about. So we met over at the church, though, and uh, it was supposed to have been with my father, but he was sick. And he said, well, you'll have to do it. And I go, I have to do it. I don't know anything about doing anything like this. I said, I know what I'll do. I'll invite the community. So I invited the community. And we were on TV, national TV, for two hours talking about Kengar, the things that we had in Kengar, what we did, and how we did it. Um, in February, 2000, February 7, 2013, uh, there was a bill, a House bill, 842, sponsored by Delegates Guterres, Carr, and Wallstriker, and a Senate bill sponsored by Senator Richard, Senate Bill 712, I'm sorry, sponsored by Senator Richard S. Maldin, Mal, Madalino, Richard's going to kill me on that, I know how to say his name, Madalino Jr., requesting funds to refurbish this building. Uh, those were bills I had to go to Annapolis to testify on. Uh, the beauty about that was that one day I was told to come here and meet with Ike Leggett, who was the county executive at the time, to look at the building. And it was like his man in the county kept saying, you ought to tear it down, got to tear it down. And Ike said to me, he said, Karen, what do you want to do? And I was shocked because who, the county executive's asking me, what do I want to do with this building? And I said, well, it's historical. I want you to fix it up. You need to fix the heat. You need to fix the air conditioning. You need to fix everything in this building. Are you comfortable today? You comfortable? OK, so to me, it means that the heat is working. OK, normally it doesn't, but it's working today. OK, so the bill was passed, and we got $100,000 from the state. $100,000 from American Disabilities, and $100,000 from the county to redo this building. Uh, and this, the beauty about it is it looks like a community center. The colors look like a community center. We had a dull gray, uh, no, dull green. And the man that wanted to tore down even put in a nasty, I mean, a very nasty looking military green in the back. It was horrible, horrible. He didn't want to change it, but I guess I had a little bit clout with the county executive legate, because I called and asked them to please change it in the back, because you want to be bright and inviting when you come into a community center. You want to use it, you know. And I want, I want to add into that uh, all the times when they were doing the first remodeling of the community center in 1992, because um, we had some problems. I want to thank the town of Kensington. The town of Kensington graciously let us come to the armory to do our share program. Whenever we needed something extra or help or whatever, we could always go to the town of Kensington and ask. And I know this because I've been going through a lot of papers, and I see different mayor's names on the papers. And also through Spark, we went to, uh, we sent some kids down to the cable TV company to learn production. And that was through the town. So we've had a good, a good partnership with the town of Kensington. Whenever we needed help, if we needed extra help, we could always go to the town for whatever help we needed. And uh, along this railroad bank, the ladies' auxiliary, 
I guess that's what they call them. They helped plant the, the trees because the community did not want the brick wall, even though you're gonna have a lot of background noise from the railroad track today. You're gonna have it, okay? Um, in 20, uh, January 25th, 2014, the name of the Kengar Community Center was changed to the Leonard D. Jackson Kengar Community. That was a very special day, excuse me, for my family. Uh, to have it put my father's name, we thank him. 2017, a lot of people, the town and all, participated in the 125 year reunion or, yeah, it, it was a reunion for most of us. It was also, Ken Gar became 125 years old. It was a big to-do. They used the whole, I mean the whole community, churches, the community center, the parking lots, the playgrounds. There was something going on every place in this community, and that's what community is about. On, um, March, I'm sorry, May the, what was it, 21st of this year? We celebrated the 130 year anniversary of Ken Gar. The only thing, it wasn't as big as the 125 year. It was a hot day, very hot day. We started out in the morning. We had um, Edith Rockmorton Park. We had a rededication of the park down, in, down the way of the Edith Rockmorton Park who was an NAACP president, but she was also one of the teachers in Montgomery County. And to show the disparity when they finally went to the white schools, they were not, she was a principal too in the black schools, but when she went to the white schools, they made her, they offered her the job as a teacher and not as a principal, and she turned it down. So that just goes to show you a lot of them were, a lot of the principals in the black schools were educated and knew what they were doing, but they weren't gonna settle for less than what they would do. And those are good people to, their backs are good things to be on. Very good. Um, so that's all I know about Ken Gars Community Center. It's a lot. Uh, we've come a long way, baby, as they say and hope to keep on going. Now the community center is run by Montgomery County government, Montgomery County Recreation Department. When it was renewed, um, when it was um, redone and renamed, the recreation department took it over. So now they run it and they have some activities here for therapeutic recreation. Uh, once in a while they have meetings here. Uh, the community still uses it for birthday parties, uh, wedding receptions, uh, baby showers. So I guess we're just a part in the community. We like to have a good time. That's all I can say about this building in Kingar. Thank you very much for having me.